Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on today's Trade Talks of the American Indian Arts and, Arts and Crafts Act. Um, my name is Kaya Jackson. I am the business development, um, the export business development specialist for our um, MBDA Export Center. Um, we are housed with we are housed with the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development Center. Um, just a real quick overview of them. Uh, their National Center is a nonprofit that focuses on assisting um, American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians with economic and business development. They do this through uh, several different programs and the program that I'm underneath is our Export Center. And what we do there is we help minority owned businesses who are looking to get into the global market. And so we assist with helping them do so. Uh, today, we um, we provide many different trainings through our trade talks, and today we have Kenneth Van Way of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, and we're going to go into anything and everything of the act in the board. Kenneth? Um, good morning. Um, as, as Kia said, I'm uh, Ken Van Way. I'm a program analyst with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. I'm gonna, before we get into presenting here, I'm gonna give a sort of, I am a bureaucrat, so there are going to be some disclaimers. Uh, most important disclaimer, I am not an attorney. Uh, I am, a, as I said, a program analyst with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. I have many, many years of experience with this, uh, but what I am providing here is not legal advice, and I recommend that if you have really important legal questions that you consult with an attorney. Additionally, as I'll explain towards the end of this presentation, there are some potential changes to the information that I am going to be giving here. But since those are all future hypotheticals, what I am talking about right now is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act as it functions today, November 14th, 2023. With that out of the way, uh, give me a moment to share my little presentation slides. Also, we're going to uh, be taking questions along the way. If you want to raise your hand or ask a question in chat, uh, go ahead and do that so that uh, Kia can tell me that that's going on. Questions can go in the chat box onto the side. All right. As I said, I'm Ken Van Way with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, which is an agency with the India with the U.S. Department of the Interior. Indian craft work is beautiful, but is often copied. We we have here some examples of uh, some uh, silver inlay pieces that were imported from the Philippines, just sort of to, to give an idea of some of the, the problem that we face. Uh, there's always some difficulty with doing a video, so I'm not gonna try this this afternoon, but there is a PSA that Secretary Halland has done in support of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act that you can find on the department's YouTube page. Or if you go to the Indian Arts and Crafts Board's webpage, which we're going to repeat this website <laughs> numerous times, but it's www.doi.gov slash IACB, you, you can see this, pre this uh, public service announcement from the secretary. Very I'll nice. add it in the chat box, and then I'll also put it into the resources that I send out after the, the web webinar. Perfect. Thank you. So, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board promotes the economic development of American Indians and Alaska Natives of federally recognized tribes through the expansion of the Indian Arts and Crafts market. The board estimates that the annual sales of Indian and Indian style art and craft work exceed $1.5 billion per year. And in light of the importance of the uh, art and craft market to communities and individuals. Uh, Congress passed the Indian Arts and Crafts Act originally in 1935 with subsequent amendments in 1990, 2000, and 2010 
which consistently charge the Indian Arts and Crafts Board to protect Indian artists, their creative work, and tribal economies through the act. So at its heart, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is a truth and marketing law that prohibits the offer or display for sale or sale of any art or craft product in a manner that falsely suggests it is Indian made. There are criminal and civil penalties to the act, and we'll, we'll discuss those in more depth as our morning progresses. And the principal focus of the act is to protect enrolled members of federally recognized tribes. So the Indian Arts and Crafts Act covers a variety of both traditional and non-traditional styles of, of art and craft work. We have some examples here for jewelry, beadwork, weavings, but these are not necessarily the confines to what's covered by the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. If it is an art or craft work and it is made by an Indian, or if it is made by a non-Indian and being sold as Indian made, then that is a violation of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act potentially. So over the years, we've identified sort of three larger categories for, for how you would characterize the, the violations that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board sees. Oh, one would be counterfeiters, which is people who are copying and signing a particular artist's name. So if there's a famous artist or a famous jeweler or a famous potter, people are making copies of that style of work and selling them falsely as the work of that individual. There are also individuals who are claiming a false tribal affiliation, which is somebody who is not an enrolled member of a federally or state recognized Indian tribe or certified as a non-member Indian artisan who is claiming to be a Native American and that is just not the case. And finally, there are, as we showed at the, the, my first slides, there are manufacturers who produce a, a large quantity of Native American style goods, which are then wholesaled and then subsequently <laughs> sold through, through retail outlets as Indian products when they're not. So there are criminal penalties to the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Um, the 2010 Act, I believe, uh, established a, a smaller, uh, a, a dual system for uh, penalties. So if there's a total sale of less than $1,000, uh, an individual faces potential fines up to $25,000 or imprisonment not to exceed a year, and a corporation could be fined up to $100,000. If the sale amount is more than $1,000, an individual can be fined up to a quarter million dollars or imprisoned up to five years, and a corporation could be fined up to a million dollars. There's also a, a third... <laughs> tier on this, which is somebody who has been convicted of an Indian Arts and Crafts Act violation who is a repeat offender and convicted a second time, could be fined up to a million dollars, imprisoned up to 15 years, and a corporation could be fined up to five million dollars. The Indian Arts and Crafts Act also contains civil provisions that allow an Indian tribe, an Indian Arts and Crafts organization, an individual Indian, or the Attorney General of the United States to, to bring a suit in federal court on behalf of one of those. And if successful in the, the, the suit, could get injunctive or other equitable relief uh, treble damages, or no less than $1,000 for each day of offer or display for sale. Punitive damages and the, the cost of the suit, which 
Again, I've mentioned that I'm not an attorney, but it's my understanding that costs of suit is a significant thing, uh, being able to recoup your legal costs in a lawsuit, because that can be expensive. I will have some examples as we get further along in the uh, presentation of some civil suits and some uh, criminal cases. But I did want to, before we get to that, sort of lay out sort of the, the groundwork on the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So for purposes of, of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, an Indian is an enrolled member of a federally recognized Indian tribe, Alaska Native village, or an Alaska Native corporation as defined under the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Uh, they can also be an enrolled member of an officially state recognized tribe or certified by a tribe of their lineal descent as a non-member Indian artisan. Uh, do we have any questions up to this point? All right. No questions so far, sorry. Okay, oh no, no, no problem. I, I assumed by default. So when we're talking about, oh, we have a question. We All have right. one um, from Joanne Nota. Years ago, the Urban Outfitters sold products described as Navajo, for example, Navajo design bikini or a Navajo design flask. What had happened to this case? I actually have a slide on that that we'll get to in a little bit. Okay, and then one more. And um, okay, Scott Defoya asked, if, "Can we have a copy of the latest version of the act?" Yes, I can provide a link to Kia to make available to you to the the current language. Okay, awesome. That's how we have okay. so far. All right, so yeah, so i'm gonna detour a little bit then so the indian arts and crafts act itself is i, I had a question and i have a okay. question too okay okay um let's go for the the first i didn't see who is speaking but the the gentleman who's that, that first would, yeah that would be me um you know when out. you go to the santa fe indian plaza I'd say half of those people, if not more than half, they're peddling native jewelry that are made somewhere else. And then they flask it with a featured artist who is Native American and feature their stuff. But everything else <laughs> is, to me, is questionable where it comes from. So how are they able to do that is it you know I, I'm, i've often wondered that and i think everyone knows that and there's people that have been shooed out of there for selling non-native products saying you know claiming that it is native products and i even think some of them have been convicted but it's like it's like a slap on a, fa a hand the wrist so how effective are these laws that you just talked about and has ever anybody really been convicted to where they're non i mean non -re a repeat offender <laughs> uh, there have been people who have been convicted uh enforcement is still is an ongoing process uh in new mexico uh there are both state and federal laws and i know the state attorney general's office has taken action against some of those businesses as well. Are you talking about the businesses around the plaza or are you talking about individuals who are selling, say, at, at the portal? The businesses. The businesses. And, and, and a lot of these owners are, are foreign uh, owners. So like the galleries? Right. Right. Well, was, if, if you're aware of something that's going on, definitely get in touch with us. Uh, you, you can reach us uh, toll-free at 888-278-3253. And we also have an online complaint form that's available through our website 
at www.doi.gov slash IACB. And that's where all and violations I, can I, be I, reported. I hesitate to, to talk. I'm not, I'm not going to go, go on record here about any particular businesses or any particular situation, but we are certainly interested in that. And if you have additional information, we would love to receive it. Okay. But um, so the f all violations can be reported to your um, – to to the board, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. And does this act apply to um, imported knockoff products as well that are yes. imported if, from other countries? If something is being sold as American Indian or Alaska Native made or the product of a particular Indian artist or the product of a particular Indian tribe, that needs to be a truthful statement. So the act would apply to those products if they're if they're being misrepresented. That something like that, if it is made in a Native American style and is offered as say Native American style or Southwestern, that that's potentially a, not as confusing a, a language. But if something is being sold in a manner that that falsely offers or displays it for sale as Indian made or the product of a particular Indian tribe, then that would be an Arts and Crafts Act violation. And if you're in doubt, don't hesitate to bring it to our attention and we can have attorneys and law enforcement people take a look at it to, to see if it meets uh, the standard of an Indian Arts and Crafts Act violation. Okay. And kind of... Um... Piggybacking off of that question, Scott Tafoya um, asked if those businesses are not required to just sell Native art. Like those businesses are not required to just sell Native art, right? Uh, a business is allowed to sell what it's going to sell. They just have to be truthful about what they're selling. They're organ and the I know New, New Mexico, mm -hmm. right. New Mexico also has uh, some more particular rules as well but I am both not an attorney and not a representative of New Mexico State. But I, I would recommend uh, looking into the New Mexico State law as well. And we have a, a joint brochure on our website that we put together with the New Mexico State Attorney General's office that covers both of those uh, laws. Okay. All right, sort of following along on that, uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act does require that a product that is being sold as an Indian product or sold as Indian made, that that does need to, to be the truth. So in our regulations, which are at 25 CFR section 309, I think. Anyway, I, we'll provide a link to this as well that we have a chart in there for what is and is not considered an Indian product based on the degree of involvement by American Indian or Alaska Native producers. So a product that it, it ranges down a spectrum from something that is uh, conceived, designed, and made by an Indian, we'd consider to be an Indian product, uh, something that incorporates some machine-made parts, but some regular, you know, the, the work of their hands is considered to be an Indian product. Something that is designed by a Native American designer, but is produced using non-Indian labor or produced entirely, you know, <laughs> through, through some sort of other process. We would consider that to be an Indian designed product. Uh, some of this, again, this is a domestic law, but since we're talking here in terms of importing, some of, some of this may also apply in, in terms of uh, how you're describing work uh, for export as well. 
uh, a product that's in the style of an Indian art or craft product, but not made by an Indian. So that would be the, the jewelry that is imported. That's not an Indian product and cannot be sold as Indian made. Uh, in cases of collaborative works between an Indian and a non-Indian, uh, the Arts and Crafts Act requires that the labor to the or the interpretation for, for our regulations requires that the labor component of that be 100% Indian. So if it's a collaborative work between an Indian and a non-Indian, we would not consider that to be an Indian product. But it can still be truthfully represented, naming the name of the artist along with their tribal enrollment and then the name of the other artist or other, other people who are involved in the production that does not list their tribe. And that avoids making a false suggestion to consumers that that's entirely Indian produced. I have another question. I have a question too. I never got to ask yet. Go ahead. So what my question is, is that I, I'm a Clinket from Canada. I live close to the U Alaskan border by uh, Haines, Alaska and Skagway. And I have a Bannock mix product that I produce. I've created it and I now have it in manufactured in Canada, but I have them on both U.S. language and Canadian language, and I have a trademark in both. How would that fit under this if I was exporting it out to Alaska and I wanted, I sold my product in Alaska or even California or anywhere in the U.S.? Okay, so, so for purposes of the act, and I'm not sure if we have a slide for this or if that's something that, that's such a, an edge case we didn't really get into it. But in the regulations, we, we, we do get into this, that if something is being made and sold by somebody who is an enrolled member of a, an Indian tribe or Indian group from outside of the United States, they would should be identifying the country that they are their tribe is from or the, the country yeah, that they're enrolled in. I do have a Clinket Haida card. Oh, from within the United States? Yeah. In okay. June. Well, if, you, if you're enrolled in a tribe in the United States, then you would be able to just sell your work as a, that tribe if you're enrolled. Okay. And okay. then how does the J Treaty fit in? Uh, I am not an expert on the J-Tree. Okay. Anyway, Teresa, I had wrote you a, a message in the chat. Um, I can contact you afterwards with more, um, too, so we can discuss that more in length. But if we could hold off on the question, Randy, until um, afterwards, I want to get, I want Kenneth to keep um, going with the presentation. We've got a lot All of good questions, right. but we want to get through the presentation. Thanks. Right. I guess the, the important thing to remember is that the Indian Arts and Crafts Act is a domestic United States law. So you're really going to need to consult with an attorney or an expert on international trade about how it applies outside of the United States. That Veering back to the presentation, our recommendation for identifying your authentic Indian products is to include your name, the name of the tribe that you're enrolled in, and if applicable, the enrollment number so that people can follow up on that. I know there are a lot of privacy concerns, so putting out your enrollment number may or may not be a good idea. Uh, this is merely the recommended method of identifying authentic Indian products, and it is not required. Going back to the enforcement, and certainly uh, that is a major concern that people have, and is, is the Indian Arts and Crafts Act being enforced. Uh, the Indian Arts and Crafts Board is an artist promotion agency and economic development agency that was 
also given some consumer protection authority but we are not a law enforcement organization so with the expanded criminal provisions under the indian arts and crafts act of 1990 and the subsequent uh, amendments the board has always sought to work with law enforcement via the fbi other department of interior agencies other outside organizations to, to provide that law enforcement support two things that are, that are important to current enforcement are that in the indian arts and crafts amendments act of 2010 congress authorized any federal law enforcement officer to conduct indian arts and crafts act investigations and prior to that the the fbi had been designated officially as the agency on under the act and uh we have since uh, expanded gone through through a variety of uh agreements we finally settled in 2012 into a memorandum of agreement with the fish and wildlife service office of law enforcement it doesn't come completely out of the blue because Fish and Wildlife Service had already been working with Native American issues with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and the Bald and Gold Eagle Protection Act. So there, there were a variety of uh, sort of points of similarity with some of the, their existing enforcement. So we established an agreement with them and Fish and Wildlife work with the Indian Arts and Crafts Board at this point in time to do the investigations for, for complaints that come into the Indian Arts and Crafts Board office. We have had some recent enforcement uh, cases. Uh, for, for some legal reasons, I can't really get into some of the Southwesty stuff. Uh, I know someone had mentioned some of the, the New Mexico cases. I'm not really able to talk about those, but if you Google Indian Arts and Crafts Act Santa Fe, you can find some of the information on, on some of those cases. Uh, the most recent cases that we've had with, with the act, though, have been uh, U.S. versus Koalas in Texas, which was a jewelry case where uh, a fellow was uh, recently... Uh, sentenced to five years probation and had to pay some money in restitution. We had two cases in Washington state in Seattle that have garnered a surprising amount of press attention uh, get, given the other things that we've been up to. But there were some uh, cases that were settled or uh, the, the sentencing came out earlier this year for uh, Rath and Van Dyke, who were both, I guess, Rath was a jeweler. No, Rath was a carver. It's hard to say. I mean, they, they did a lot of different stuff. But they were, were selling their work as Indian made or as the product of particular Indian tribes in Washington State, in addition to some other in one case, some uh, unlawful possession of eagle parts. Uh, there is more information available publicly on these cases. There have also been some civil cases. Uh, somebody has already mentioned Navajo Nation versus Urban Outfitters. This is a civil case. As I pointed out there, there is no requirement that the Indian Arts and Crafts Board be involved in a civil case that a tribe, an individual artist, or an Indian arts and crafts organization can bring a suit without directly involving the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Uh, the Navajo Nations versus Urban Outfitters occurred with the Navajo Nations attorneys and not with the U.S. Department of Justice. It was filed in 2012 against Urban Outfitters and several of its subsidiaries. Urban Outfitters was marketing several products as Navajo, including clothing, jewelry, and household accessories. So the, the examples we have here are of a sweater, 
the the infamous Navajo flask, some earrings. I seem to recall there was also a, a bracelet of some sort, and then the, the also the infamous Navajo panties and, and some other goods. Uh, since Navajo had some trademarks registered as well, they were able to sue for both trademark infringement and Indian Arts and Crafts Act violations. And I guess the, the question had been raised about what happened to it. Uh, the case was settled in November 2016, but the settlement agreement is between Navajo Nation and Urban Outfitters. I've never seen it, and some of that is some protected information just between those two parties. Uh, I understand that Urban Outfitters entered into a supply and licensing agreement of some sort with the Navajo Nation, and since I am not part of the process, I actually do not know the, the full extent of whatever their agreement was. Another civil case, again, brought without the Indian Arts and Crafts Board that I, I like to, to point to as an example of what, what people can do to use the act to help control things. Uh, the Quileute tribe, who are a, a Northwestern tribe, are, for whatever reason, the tribe that the author of the Twilight books chose to make the werewolves in the Vampire versus Werewolf Gang War. Uh, and National Entertainment Collectibles was manufacturing and selling items related to the, the Twilight movies one of which was a metal cuff bracelet and choker that they sold as Kuliute as part of uh, their, the Twilight marketing campaign. Uh, the tribe brought a suit based on, on the, the marketing of these products, uh, and the company settled in 2015 with a stipulation that they would not market the items using the tribe's name without the permission of the tribe. Indian Arts and Crafts Board took a, a shot at a, a civil suit as well uh, that, that was settled before it went to court with Pendleton uh, as negotiated through Department of Justice. Pendleton had been marketing some products using the unqualified terms Sioux and Lakota. Uh, and in the settlement agreement between us, Department of Justice and Pendleton, Pendleton donated a little bit over $40,000 to the Heritage Center at Red Cloud Indian School in Pine Ridge to promote authentic Sioux art, and it revised their website and catalogs to clarify their advertising language and included information about the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. So I would mentioned before, if you want to file a complaint about something, uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Board has a small staff. Uh, we can't be everywhere and we can't see everything. So definitely uh, presume that we haven't seen it if you see something and want us to know about it. So if you can contact us, uh, provide as much information as possible, the who, what, when, and where, uh, any documentation you can have, links, screenshots, flyers, catalogs, things like that. Uh, really important is at least some general information about who's doing it. Uh, the more contact information, the better. And as I said, we have a, an online complaint form that you can use, which you can use to make an anonymous complaint as well through our website. And we also have a, a toll-free number, 888-278-3253 or 888-ART-FAKE, and our website is www.doi.gov slash IACB. The board does a lot more than just uh, enforce the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, though. We have three museums, one in Anadarko, Oklahoma, one in Rapid City, South Dakota, and one in Browning, Montana. 
These museums have historic and contemporary collections of Plains Indian art. We use these museums to showcase the work of up and coming contemporary artists from around the country. Uh, if you contact us again at the Indian Arts and Crafts Board website, we can get you in touch with the chief curator for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, uh, who can then work with the, the curators at the individual museums about possible shows as a way to promote your work or if you have friends who might be interested. And we also use those museums to serve the, the local communities with cultural outreach activities and uh, workshops. The board also publishes a source directory of American Indian and Alaska Native owned and operated arts and crafts businesses, which is quite a mouthful. So we generally just refer to it as the source directory. We provide free business listings on the website, of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board website, to businesses that are owned by enrolled members of federally recognized tribes or Alaska Native villages or corporations. Uh, the source directory is promoted by the board through our website, through ads in consumer publications, through Facebook, and through other uh, print advertisements. The source directory was organized by state. This is a sample entry here. Uh, but we have recently been, been taking, a, within the last year, making an effort to make it more user-friendly and to allow searchability. So as things advance, people will be able to search by, say, category for basket, or search for something by the, the tribe of the artist or, or owner of the business. Uh, we have information on the Indian Arts and Crafts Board website about applying for it and an application form. And if you have any other questions or are interested in it, let us know. board also does outreach. Uh, we do uh, outreach through our, this is uh, through our museum. Uh, there's a much younger me uh, doing a presentation at our Museum of the Plains Indian in Browning, Montana. Uh, we do artist workshops where we bring in artists and businesses, uh, representatives of other government agencies, provide, say, an afternoon-long or, or day-long presentation for artists on a variety of topics. Uh, we participate in major Indian art markets, including the Red Earth Festival in Oklahoma City, uh, Santa Fe Indian Market, the Herd Museum Guild Show in Arizona, uh, and, and other, other, uh, other art shows and markets to provide a lot of the information we're talking about here and talk to consumers and artists. The Indian Arts and Crafts Board also works to get information on intellectual property, especially copyright and trademark to artists and craftspeople. Uh, last year, we put on with Patent and Trademark Office and the Indian Dispute Resolution Services a series of webinars run through Patent and Trademark Office on e-commerce for Native American artists and craftspeople. It was intended to provide information on web platforms, marketing, legal issues, uh, to, to help bring artists online more. Uh, the videos are available uh, if you search for e-commerce for Native American artists, USPTO, YouTube. You can, can find the link to the, uh, the web series. The board also has published and will be publishing a revised version in the, the near future, hopefully the near future of a joint IACB-USPTO brochure on intellectual property. 
including copyright, trademark, and design patent information. You can find that brochure on our website as it exists. There are some minor price issues and some, some dead links, but otherwise the uh, information is still accurate. And we also promote in webinars like this one to, to promote our marketing programs for artists and businesses. I mentioned earlier that we have a, a brochure that we put together with the New Mexico State Attorney General's Office. We actually have several brochures of that nature with Oklahoma State, Texas State, uh, the state of Montana, Alaska. All of those are available online, or you can contact us to, to get a copy if you're from a state that has an Indian Arts and Crafts Law. Uh, there are 13 or 14 states, and we do not have 13 or 14 brochures, but certainly uh, we'll eventually get there. We also publish some art form specific brochures on uh, Diné weavings, on turquoise, on Alaska Native ivory products, and on Alaska Native sea otter products. These are to help answer consumer questions and to help pr promote the art forms themselves. If you're involved with something and, and would like a, a copy of some of these brochures to distribute through your business, uh, go ahead and get in touch with us as well. We do other things to promote authentic Indian art. We do a calendar uh, each year with uh, samples of fine art, information about the Indian Arts and Crafts Board and the Act, and some general contact information. We distribute these to tribes. We distribute these through major art events to consumers and artists. We take out a variety of consumer education advertisements through uh, trade magazines, through uh, tourist centered magazines. And we also take out airport ads in at airport kiosks or, or some of those over your over your luggage uh, video screens to, to promote that the act to tourists and make people make sure that people are aware of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act and of the, the issue of potential misrepresentation. As I mentioned before, there are some potential changes on the horizon to the things that I've said here. Uh, Number one is the uh, proposed Respect Traditional Indigenous Skill and Talent Act of 2023. It was introduced uh, in the spring of this year as a, a discussion draft by the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs that looks to potentially update the Indian Arts and Crafts Act to support creative economies and strengthen the enforcement of the current law and protections. There was a comment period. The comment period ended earlier this year. I'm sure your representatives are, are still interested in hearing from constituents. And you can find information about the, the draft uh, discussion bill through, through the link that's provided there. Or just by Googling Artist Act 2023. Should, should also help, help you find it. Or not to be uh, promoting any particular uh, web search, you could use Ask Jeeves or DuckDuckGo or, or whatever your preferred uh, web search engine is. But this could potentially change some of the definitions. Uh, any number of the things that I, I talked about earlier could potentially be changed through, through uh, legislation. There is also a proposal from the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs to amend the regulations for the Indian Arts and Crafts Act uh, that would expand potentially expand the definition of an Indian product to include agricultural products, uh, services, uh, 
things things of that nature that, that fall out what we would currently consider to be an art or craft product that would allow for non-Indian labor to produce Indian products in some cases and that would create a new certification trademark to certify that an item is an Indian product that would then be uh, administered through the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. The official comment for this ended on September 1st, 2023, but as things move forward in the regulatory process, there will likely be additional opportunities for comment. With that, I'd like to again say you can contact the Indian Arts and Crafts Board at 888-278-3253 or through our website at www.doi.gov slash IACB. Uh, you can also email us directly at IACB at IOS, as in Sam, dot DOI dot gov. And that takes us to the end of the slide part. Okay. We have some questions here. Um, All right. Is why does the IACB directory limit only artists from federally recognized tribes when the act includes state and or other certified Indians? What is the difference? <clears throat> the Indian Arts and Crafts Act if you if you go into the, the the fine line by line the indian arts and crafts act specifies which sections of the act apply to state recognized tribes and certified non-member indian artisans uh and those are very specifically the criminal and civil provisions the indian arts and crafts board services our services provided by the board as a, an agency of the Department of the Interior, and those services are designated for enrolled members of federally recognized tribes. Okay. Um, will we receive these slides? Is that, are the slides available to distribute? I'm going to have to check on that. If they are, I will make them available to Kia. Okay. Um, next one we have, will the new Artists Act address the issues with individuals who claim Indian enrollment in ancestry, even though they are not recognized by a tribe? For example, the current issue, musician Buffy um, St. Marie. The... It has been a while since I have seen that, that draft legislation. I believe that the, the draft the draft that I saw in the spring did broaden what would be considered to be an Indian art or craft product. But since it hasn't happened yet, I can't say whether or not it would apply. That if the there are there are a variety of things that, that do not fall under the act right now that people are concerned about. Uh, literature that there are, there are novelists and other literary figures, uh, academics, musicians, other performers who are allegedly misrepresenting themselves as Native American when they're not in, in the pursuit of those particular things. Some of that would potentially be, be covered if Congress makes the change to include that. But it's, it's, it's all a hypothetical right now. But so, if they broaden the scope of the act to include those other things, then those other things would be included under the act. Okay. Uh, the next one is, do any of the e-commerce programs offer any clarification about tax liabilities when selling online? Most tax accountants that I have asked aren't familiar. Um, that's this. completely outside of my <laughs> sphere yeah. of knowledge. I am also not an accountant in addition to not being an attorney. Uh, Chrissy, I can email you later with, um, um, I can email you later so we can talk about that more. Um, Scott Foya asked, will the recording be available to share? 
So I can share the recording with our registered um, viewers who, who have registered, but other than that, through the system, it is not able to be shared until National Center, um, National Center um, um, puts it on their YouTube page, but that takes them that takes a while, a couple of months. So as if, if you know someone who wants to see this um, presentation, uh, please email me separately and I can, op I can open the registration strictly for that individual. And that way they can have access to the recording. Okay. Also, if they, if they just like to give us a call and talk with us, they can do that too. That too. Um, I will, um, email is it okay oh, i'll email your contact slide that you had on the screen oh absolutely okay. that's fine all right um if we have any more questions i think randy had a question before randy benali if you still have that yeah question, uh, like to share you know i was just looking at your web page and you know it, it's interesting that you mentioned you know some of the things that you did because it it to me it seems like it's more geared towards if somebody's claiming authenticity that they're native and they're not but what about businesses that actually sell wholesale products that are right in the open and they're and you know they're coming from the philippines and they even say it they operate as a business and the sad truth behind this is there's a lot of now natives that go in there and buy wholesale from these same people. <laughs> you know yes, what I'm saying? Yes. I mean the, the the act the act is what it is. Uh, if people are breaking the or if people are breaking the law, we would like to hear about it. Uh, and and I guess I guess my question to that is is this Philippine jewelry store. Is it legal for them to sell Native American jewelry in there? Because I, I don't think there's any item that pertains to Philippines in there. It's a variety of Native American jewelry. So. And I think they do they, claim they sell, that it is the Philippines. If they are selling the jewelry as Indian or Native American, and it is not just something that looks Indian or Native American, then that would fall under the act. If somebody is just selling something as Southwestern, that might not. But you know, their sign like says, that. right, their sign says beads, fetish, turquoise, sterling silver, wholesale price. And their store has designs of native, uh, native stuff. <laughs> Well, you know, I would love to get more information on that off of the direct video chat. If you wanted to, to contact us about that at uh, IACB at ios.doi.gov, mention that you talked okay. to Ken. Uh, I certainly can't, I mean, the description of something that I, I'm not seeing, I, I certainly can't can't venture. But we yeah. would rather look look at something and have it not be a problem than not look at something and have it be a problem. So definitely get in touch. Okay. Thank you. Hi. If we have no more questions, and let me check really quick. We, we don't. So um, we can go ahead and conclude. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for this presentation today and thank you to all of our registrants for attending our webinar. Um, I will get out the um, the recorded webinar link to you guys, but you ha it has to be for, um, the only way to access it is if you guys registered for the event itself through our system. If you would like to share it, then like I said, um, please email me directly. Um, about getting that person who wants to view the session or like Kenneth said, contact them directly as well. And then I'll get out the contact information and then the information you stated about the um, the websites, the resources, and then the violation information. 
I'll put that all in an email and send that out to you guys. But um, if we have any other, everyone saying thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys thank for you joining us. Thank you very much. Us.